Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Mania Madan, and we're going to be speaking about blood biologics and platelet-rich plasma on the OI show. Well, thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Mania Madan, and uh, we are super stoked. Uh, we were classmates. We were uh, a year or two apart in optometry school. And it's been a super long time since we've got to catch up. So what better way to do it than on the OI show? How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And yes, you are right. We are a couple of years apart in school. And if anyone's wondering, I'm younger. I'm the younger one. <laughs> so, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, super. So uh, tell us a little bit about where you practice and, and your practice, your family, like how you're involved in optometry. Yeah. Um, well, I practice in the beautiful city of Vancouver. I'm uh, in a um, ophthalmology optometry practice, um, which is kind of very unique for us here in Vancouver, or at least in British Columbia in Canada here. Um, but it's working out very, very well. Um, so my, I specialize in or kind of see a lot of patients with dry eye and glaucoma management and kind of working in the field where we're integrating and um, taking care of patients with our ophthalmology colleagues. Um, and that's been a really great kind of move in my career. Um, I'm also president for BC Doctors of Optometry uh, this year, and that's a new role. I'm super excited to you know, talk about optometry at a larger global, at a national scale uh, with our colleagues. And then on a personal level, I've got three uh, young kids, uh, five, eight, and 10. I'm so excited. They're gonna be going back to school in September. <laughs> my little one's starting kindergarten and uh, yeah, um, so it's it's mm -hmm. it's fun it's busy yeah it is mm -hmm. so I used to have a five eight and ten year old but she just had her birthday so we've got a six eight and ten year old we're on the same track yeah, youngest sure. one starting kindergarten so we're at the same place very cool uh, yeah. um, I want to dig in a little bit on this practice scenario how long have you been digging your teeth into the dry eye arena right it seemed like kind of all of us kind of dabble for a little while but then there becomes this line in the sand where most people draw and they're like I'm going to be a dry eye doctor this is going to be a major emphasis how long has that been happening for you you know it's actually kind of a cool story um a Dave it was it was actually your lecture that I heard back in 2012 or 2013. You'd come to Vancouver at one of the BCDO conferences and you gave this really great lecture, uh, you know, back then talking about the tear film, talking about the meibomian glands and, you know, and looking at the meibom quality that's starting to come up. And that was really fascinating. And I thought you just delivered this information so well that it intrigued and interest, uh, you know, in me. I had just moved back from the United States after doing a residency uh, in Texas and uh, you know which was very disease heavy and lots of dry eye and so just was trying to figure out what I wanted to do in in Vancouver at that time I knew I didn't want to be um, in just you know in a private practice and nothing there's nothing wrong with that but just with all the training that I've had and all that stuff and where my interest was and so when I heard your lecture I was like wow this is really interesting um, and so I kind of took it upon myself to start looking at uh, more reading material maybe some journals some studies and articles and trying to just educate myself and then started investing in some of the diagnostic equipments right how do we start uh, uh, you know, diagnosing this in our patients, and then came the treatments uh, after that. And it's also really fascinating how much dry eye has changed, right? So there was that interest, but then also this technology of diagnosis and treatment started to really catch up that uh, we could be really excited, not just for the science of it, but also how we can help patients. And so that's kind of where the journey started. Mm -hmm. I would say, in the, yeah, and then being in that ophthalmology practice as well, where I was seeing patients, uh, you know, that were referred in for so many different things and, and starting to look at these things, um, being one of the earlier ones in the Vancouver area, um, you know, having some of these diagnostic equipments to look for these things. Yeah, it started to really shape, uh, shape what I wanted to do. What, what kind of were some of the, the diagnostic instruments that you were unique in that you had? Well, back then, so, um, you know, osmolarity testing, 
was just mm -hmm. starting to come out or tier lab testing was coming out. Even the use of immunomodulators, um, I think maybe perhaps more in Canada, we were not, or in Vancouver, I should say, we were not, we'd just gotten our, our therapeutics to be able to prescribe medications uh, back in 2011 yeah. or so. So it was, it was a new field, you know, so it was yeah. a new field uh, at that time. Yeah. yeah. So, so fast forward to today, what, what does, um, what does dry eye look like in the whole of your practice, including all the ophthalmologists, optometrists, and then what does it look like specifically for you? Yeah, I mean, I think now we really do understand that dry eye has a significant impact on patients' quality of life. I think many of us are more empathetic towards it. I feel the ophthalmologists are as well. Uh, there was a time where it was just, you know, baby shampoo and uh, here's a drawer of artificial tears and there's yeah. bigger diseases to worry about. Let's not, this is not it. You know, you, you, you can see 2020 and uh, let's just be 20 happy. Uh, but I think that mindset has really shifted, right? When uh, right. I see that in the ophthalmologist and optometrist um, a mindset where we're willing to refer, we're willing to explore, we're willing to say, hey, I think somebody else can help you with this versus just saying, well, now this is not a big deal and uh, yeah. just kind of go along with it. Yeah, I often have, have wondered how many patients have suffered, continued to suffer from dry eye due to our... Uh, our our sample drawer, right? right. That they, they they don't get the right product, and they don't get a product that's going to stop or halt the progression of the disease. It just helps them feel better for another year. Yet while their progression is continued to advance, yeah. so um, so what what are some of the more advanced uh, things that you're doing in practice? Do you have you know all the technology? Do you do the IPLs? The what what is it that you're doing nowadays in your practice? Yeah, um, you know. And yeah, we are so fortunate. So I, you know, we do have some of uh, some of the big technologies that you uh, just named. So whether it's IPL or radio frequency, mm -hmm. uh, but we're still learning so much. Um, you know, some of the newer stuff that I feel like I'm working on is you know the nutrition link in dry eye, perhaps um, understanding the stress and how that impacts uh, dry eye. So, and of course we've learned that skin conditions can uh, address, you know, cause dry eye. So now we're working on having just even better questionnaires, trying to ask patients to think about some of these other things uh, in their lives. Um, so that's been really cool, but yeah, we've got radio frequency, we've got IPL, we've, uh, you know, um, use, using a lot of the technology to diagnose dry eye. And another exciting thing that we do in our practice is uh, platelet-rich plasma, as mm -hmm. you uh, lovingly call them, bloody tears. Mm -hmm. So PRP or platelet-rich plasma yeah. is um, is something that's been used for a long time, but yet not very well understood. And of people that are out there, you're probably in the top ten in the in in the world, or at least in North America, whose understanding and utilization of PRP in practice. Um, I think one of the concerns that many people have is how do I go about getting this and prescribing it? So why don't you first of all walk through how do I get the blood out of me to a point where I can get it back in me with an eye drop? <laughs> I mean, I think you you know really nailed it. So regenerative medicine is really exciting. I think we're learning that our bodies are just powerful, you know, and they are in a tight, tight balance. And sometimes we cannot just um, substitute that with, uh, you know, something that's not biological, something that's over the counter on the shelves and things like that. Um, Cause our bo bodies have such a, you know, these amazing uh, healing powers. So platelet rich plasma, um, you know, is a blood product, right? So it is, um, it's basically our blood contains uh, many different components. As we know from our biology class, it contains red blood cells. It contains white blood cells and it contains these little tiny cells called platelets, and then all these other eosinophils and you know, all these other type of uh, cells that are in our blood. And then uh, over 60% of our blood is also plasma. So what PRP really is, is getting rid of everything else in our blood except platelets and plasma, okay? So PRP is just platelet-rich plasma. And we do that by drawing the patient's blood 
and then centrifuging that blood. And when we centrifuge it, uh, we can then factor out some of the other cells. We can get rid of red blood cells and white blood cells and then just keep platelets and plasma. Then we can use that liquid, uh, which is platelets and plasma and put it in actually eye drop bottles for patients to use as eye drops. And that would be platelet rich plasma eye drops. So um, in your office, uh, you do the blood draw. Uh, somebody in your office does the blood draw and then takes the blood over to this centrifuge machine. Now, is this a special centrifuge machine that you had to specifically buy for PRP or and yeah. how, how do you go about that? Yeah, actually, you know, so we're very fortunate. So we do have a very kind of a, you know, sterile, great system set up in our clinic. So we do have a phlebologist that comes in and draws the patient's blood. And yes, there are specific centrifuges that are, um, that protect the integrity of platelets. And so the way they spin, um, you know, and the spinning speeds and how they escalate into spinning uh, in a centrifuge can really um, either degrade the platelets or maintain the quality of those platelets. So yes, there's definitely specific centrifuges that we use and there's a specific protocol to follow. And it was really fascinating when we started uh, to kind of work with uh, platelet rich plasma, uh, because as you know, there aren't any standardized studies that tell us, hey, this is the magic concentration or this is the magic formula that's going to work. We know that our blood platelets and plasma have all these great healing powers, but how do we know how, you know, what the formula is and how do we, you know, what speeds do we centrifuges at and how long or, and all these other questions. And so it was really fascinating because, uh, so my partner and I, the phlebologist that I work with, who has, you know, over 25 uh, years of experience working with platelets, um, then came up with trying so many different formulas, trying so many different um, centrifuges and actually working with a lab with act electrophoresis. So you can kind of you know, see the concentration of platelets you're going to be left with um, at the end. And also it has to be in a volume that's usable by the patients. And it has to be, you, you have to be able to deliver it to the patient as well. And, you know, it's got to last a certain amount of time that you're, you're telling them that it's going to last. So, so those were some of the challenges. And, and it was just so fascinating uh, working with platelets and, and learning all that. And so now we have um, kind of that finalized. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so what does that look like? What, like, is there a certain amount of time that is required? And then the other thing that I think many of us may not understand is, do you just take all of that and put it a hundred percent? Or you said, how do you deliver it? What's the, are you adding things to it to make it last longer? What, what does that, what does that look like? Yeah, no, this is really a great question as well. And this is kind of where I get a lot of questions about, hey, what's the difference between autologous serum and what's the difference between platelet-rich plasma? So the difference is that platelet-rich plasma keeps the platelets intact and it's just platelets and plasma. And no, uh, platelet-rich plasma does not have to be diluted. So we do not add anything else to it. And that's kind of what the studies show that uh, you know, it does not need to be diluted similar to how autologous syrup is diluted. So it is 100%, uh, which is, you know, which is um, again, keeping away any additives, any stabilizers or anything away uh, from it. So it's just regenerative medicine. And that's also what we see across medicine with PRP. It's not diluted, you know, so we learn from our dentist friends that use PRP and they use it even in much higher concentrations than what we use it in eye care. Uh, so they'll centrifuge it longer, you know, they'll actually turn it into a gelatinous gel, which is called PRF, platelet-rich fibrin. Um, and, and they're really trying to harbor as many growth factors as they possibly can in the platelets. And we see that in dermatology as well and in orthopedics. So no one is diluting it. Um, and in fact, eye care is unique because we're, we're literally the only ones that are using autologous serum, right? And whereas the other, other forms of um, areas of medicine are not, they're going right to platelet-rich plasma. And the reason is because we have higher number of growth factors in platelet-rich plasma, which is what we're really after. So there's a high, high concentration of those factors. And also they're more in their natural form. Um, you know, they have not been released as they have been in autologous serum, and then there is no dilution. So it's mm -hmm. just 100%, you know, your own body regenerative medicine. So when you've taken my blood, 
and uh, you go and now put it in a centrifuge, how long is it? Is it need to be in there um, roughly? Like, what is the amount of time that it takes for a yeah, vial so of blood? Or... When the patients come in, um, you know, so they're there for about an hour. Uh, but it's about an hour appointment uh, where we can take the blood and, uh, you know, uh, centrifuge the blood and then process it and, and have it ready for them to be able to go home and use um, as eye drops. Mm -hmm. So a toggle of serums caught on because it's something where you go and get your blood drawn and it's either sent to another pharmacy to get processed or it may be processed is that sort of thing something that could happen in PRP is that there could be a centralized location? Um, I know at your practice, you do it right there, but is that something that can be done outside of, of the practice? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think you, we can work with local labs and, uh, and say, hey, we, you know, we want to have final product, which is PRP. And, uh, and, you know, if they're willing to kind of work with you on those formulas, there are systems available as well on the market that, you know, perhaps optometrists can use in their clinics. Um, that'll kind of depend on the state laws, right? So if you're able mm -hmm. to draw blood or if you're able to bring uh, so there are definitely some barriers to this if you're able to bring somebody in to do a blood draw um, but it's actually really exciting as well um, you know I do get a lot of these questions from optometrists when I post something on social media or if I do a talk on hey this sounds really cool but how do I how do I bring this technology to my practice and that's something my partner and I are actually working on so we are working on bringing um uh, play, like personalized PRP therapy, PRP to your practice where, um, you know, we can help kind of set up how you can bring this to your patients. Um, but it would, again, depend on, um, you know, where you practice, your state laws and all these other um, hurdles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's certainly fascinating. The, um, why don't you talk a little bit about what patients experience after they've been on PRP, because um, obviously this is a novel thing that many of us haven't heard or haven't utilized. Why would I want to use that as opposed to, I mean, we could list the laundry things of things that you could use. Yeah. When do you decide with a patient, hey, it's time to, uh, to cut you and get your blood? Yeah. Um, you know, and again, this kind of goes back to one of the lectures that I listened from you back in 2012, just talking about how fascinating the tear film is, right? And when we look at the definition of what dry eye is, it says, you know, um, dry eye is loss of homeostasis of the tear film. It doesn't say it's loss of homeostasis of the cornea or the conjunctiva, mm -hmm. it says the tear film. So there must be something so amazing about this tear film that the loss of balance of this tear film, you know, causes all this ocular surface damage, but not only does it cause all that damage, but it impacts the patient's quality of life so severely that they're going, oh my God, I can't function, help me, right? So something must be so amazing about this tear film. And when we start looking at this tear film, we realize that it contains 1800 or more different molecules that are constantly working together to yeah. heal the ocular surface, to nourish the ocular surface. It contains growth factors. Um, and growth factors are really epitheliotropic, meaning that they can, um, you know, they stimulate proliferation and migration of corneal conjunctival cells. So it causes really true cellular healing, right? Right. Not something, not something that I think we can just uh, pick something from over the counter and say, hey, this now contains 1800 of those different you know, uh, molecules in a tight balance. And um, so it's really, you know, coming to that understanding that our, our bodies are powerful, that there, there is this tear film that's really, really powerful, perhaps more than what we even understand now, what it does, right? And, um, and then, so when I start to see that and I see patients, um, you know, with perhaps that are not healing well or that are not having any symptom relief from the immunomodulators or other dry eye therapies that we have started, I mean, I often don't want to reserve it for last resort, right? Uh, when we start talking about blood biologics, because when we think about it, it doesn't have any side effects. It's completely natural. It's their own body. So I do like to offer it a little bit earlier in, in the dry eye treatment plan. And I will often say it maybe in a way to reset the system, right? So it's, it's, uh, it 
kind of rehabilitates the ocular surface. And then we can still maintain it with all the other great things that we have in our toolbox. Um, the other thing I wanna tell patients is that, you know, PRP is not a competing therapy. Our ocular surface is complicated. Mm. It needs to be in a, you know, tight balance. So I don't think that it's superior or better or, you know, uh, to any of the other therapies and it's not competing with anything. I think um, we need to kind of manage it in that multidisciplinary approach, right? So if they've got lid disease, we're going to have to manage that. And, you know, we can't just throw PRP on it and say, hey, it, it fixes. So they're complementary therapies. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Um, so uh, when I do a blood draw and now I have my my pile of PRP, how long is it going to last before I'm going to need another blood draw? Yeah, so a typical blood draw will yield us about three months of PRP if mm -hmm. used at four times a day. Now, if you if use I it, don't use it, if I just use it twice a day, can I go longer? Is it going to last longer? You know, once you, and it's similar with autologous serum, so you've got to keep you know, your, um, your PRP or your autologous serum in the freezer, right? So it has to be frozen. And once you defrost a vial of autologous or PRP, then it's really only good for about seven days in the fridge, right? Because mm -hmm. um, you, you know, it doesn't have any preservatives or additives or stabilizers in it. So I do tell the patients that, uh, you know, you've got to use each vial you know, up in a week. Um, and so the concentrations, the way we've kind of done it is uh, four times a day. Mm -hmm. So I have to use it four times a day and then they will run out of that vial at the end of the, at the, end of the week um, because we don't want to last, have that vial last longer if you only use it twice a day. Do you know what I mean? Because yeah. things can grow in it. Now, right. in terms of maintenance, like say somebody really responds well and they say, well, you know, I don't want to have a blood draw every three months or you know, uh, this is kind of annoying as well. What can I do? But this really works for me. So as maintenance, I've often recommended to patients that maybe they can open up a vial every other week because uh, frozen stuff is good for about six months. And so then they uh -huh. can stretch that uh, a little bit longer. Yep. And then let's talk a little bit about costs. What's that going to cost a patient if they do PRP? And I, I realize there's some variability. You don't need to tell us your specific costs, but what, what is that going to cost a patient? And maybe you can compare it to a toggle serum or something along those lines. Yeah. So costs for patients generally for, you know, PRP, and this is uh, it, it really ranges in other areas of medicine as well, right? Like what, what dentistry will have it for versus uh, nat naturopathic clinics also have PRP, um, you know, versus your dermatologist. But in eye care, I think it could range from anywhere from $400 to $600 for a supply of three months uh, of PRP. Um, Whereas autologous, I think is around that as well. Now, of course, this might be different in the States and these are more Canadian prices, uh, but in the States you might be looking at, well, I think autologous serum, sorry, in Canada, you might be looking at around maybe 250, 300 to about 500. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's okay. terrible. What are you finding there? Yeah, no, so, somewhat in the same, same arena as if a patient used it uh, you know, two, three hundred dollars a month um, mm -hmm. might be in the arena for uh, a toggle serum. Um, similar if they, you know, had some out of pocket costs for the prescription medications and so forth. So, yeah, you know, I think that, um, I, you know, I, what I want to say is I appreciate all the work that you've done as a pioneer in helping us understand this. I mean, you were out there looking for more data. You were looking for information so that you could then piggyback on top of it. And rather than just saying, forget about it, you invested the time and the money and the you know innovation and to really go through and work through this so that those of us uh, can ride on your coattails, right? With, the, with PRP and uh, blood biologics. And I think there's a lot to learn still but uh, somebody had to get us started and, uh, you know, uh, everybody says you're the one that's the, that's the cool thing. And I sure appreciate your perspective on it. 
Well, thank you. Um, thank you for those really kind words. Um, it's, it really is fascinating uh, working with us uh, in this field and to be able to have this technology for our patients. And you're right. I mean, our understandings are changing, right? And it's just another another tool. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> well, anything else that you want to say about uh, about dry eye or blood biologics? Um, no, I think I think that's it. I think we hit it. I think you did an awesome job. Uh, so you don't need to go hear her lecture because you heard it all here. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's some great information. If you do have a chance to ever go and listen to Dr. Madan speak about blood biologics, I would highly encourage you. Obviously, some incredible information and uh, super stoked that you're going to be uh, helping bring um, the BC optometry in, uh, in some really cool directions. It's, uh, it's been awesome having you on the show. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you. It's really nice being here. Yeah. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe and stay tuned next time for more episodes of the OI show.